Ladies and gentlemen, if I could ask you to please find your seats and find your cell phones and silence or turn them off so they don't disrupt this evening's presentation. Thank you very much. Need a little table for you. Very good. One, two, three. Okay. One, two, three. One, two, three. The previous Four, five, six. I'll change it up a bit. <laughs> On that note, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to uh, the stage door canteen at the National World War II Museum here in New Orleans. I'm Dr. Mike Bell, the Executive Director of the Jenny Craig Institute for the Study of War and Democracy. And uh, for those in attendance and those watching online, thank you for joining us. Uh, another special event and a, a great opportunity. You know, before we get started, I'd like to uh, continue the museum's tradition and asking if we have any World War II veterans, home front workers, or Holocaust survivors, uh, please stand and uh, be recognized. I know we have one. <laughs> then any, uh, any veterans or active duty service members of our armed forces of any era, would you please stand or wave and uh, be recognized as well for your service? And, and I do want to give a shout out uh, as, as my personal favorite to the, the family members of the service members, the, the spouses that, that really, uh, through their contribution to the service member service, uh, made it possible. So let's give those spouses a round of applause as well. <laughs> now, in, in, in addition to our, our two guest speakers today, we have a couple other important individuals I'd, I'd like to give a shout out to. Uh, Ann Abbott, our, our dear friend and wife of our former chairman of the board, Herschel Abbott. Uh, Ann, welcome. No? Okay, not gonna give a shout? And then uh, I saw Robert though, one of our current trustees, Robert Pretty and his wife Kiki. Robert's here. Now, as, as many of you know, and you know, in addition to our uh, incredible exhibitions and programming here on the, the museum campus, we also have a very expansive and first-class educational travel program that uh, has taken people around the world to key World War II sites. And uh, we're fortunate uh, in that process to be introduced to uh, Dr. Anthony Krzyzewski, who's been on one of our tours that goes to Germany and Poland, and uh, Tony, has uh, spoken to our educational travel groups many times while in Warsaw at the Warsaw Rising Museum about his dramatic wartime experiences as a, a teenager in the 1944 uh, Warsaw Uprising, and we'll hear about that shortly. Uh, with Tony is uh, Dr. Bieta Halitska, hope I'm close there, who uh, authored Tony's biography and has worked tirelessly to to schedule and reschedule this event during the last two years uh, during the pandemic. Uh, I would like to do a, you know, a quick shout out, uh, you know, the links between the United States uh, Republic and Poland, you know, go back to the revolution. And the, uh, you know, I'm reminded that the very first monument they put at West Point is uh, to Kwasiuszko, uh, the first statue at West Point. You never know that with all the statues there. But, uh, you know, those links really go back uh, historically. And if, even if you think of the, the 14 points included a, a specific piece on an independent Poland. And, and so whether sometimes we forget that in the United States or not, I'm, I'm sure our Polish guests will remind us of those links as well. But uh, introducing our guests uh, this evening will be Dr. Jason Dazi, uh, our one of our research, research historians here at the Jenny Craig Institute. Uh, Jason is a, a, a tour de force uh, like uh, Tony. He also has a PhD from the University of Chicago. Um, 
And so he researches and writes and, uh, you know, focus on uh, intellectual history in Europe, but also on the resist against, resistance against Nazism, uh, the Holocaust. He teaches in our partnership with Arizona State University uh, and, and previously worked uh, tirelessly researching into the 72,000 Americans still missing in action from uh, World War II. And so, uh, you know, thanks, Jason, for what you do to contribute to our content and our mission uh, and, and all these programs. You've really uh, made those special. And I know that even the ASU students uh, benefit from, from your painstaking dedication. Uh, I understand that one of our uh, Arizona State University partners, Dr. Jan Mann, is also watching from Arizona. So, you know, all those online, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, but uh, for the group in the audience, you know, we'll have an opportunity for uh, Jason to have a discussion with our team, and then uh, we'll turn it over at the end for your questions. So if, if Jason doesn't get the question you want, save that up and make sure you ask it. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm National World War II Museum welcome to our guests this evening. Over to you, Jason. Mike, thanks very much, and let me just say thank you to everybody who's joined us here in person for this, um, this very special event and who's following us online. This is a real delight for me to get a chance to talk with two professors, Z. Anthony Tony Khrushchevsky and Professor Beata Halitska, and about a story about a history that's not very well known in the U.S., but it should be. And so we're going to try to make some sense out of this history and talk about it via this brand new book that's come out, written by Professor Halitska, called Borderlands Biography, Z. Anthony Khrushchevsky in Wartime Europe and Postwar America. You'll be able to purchase copies of this book afterwards. So it's a really unique thing, I think, since I, I work also on often on individual cases but Beata, to be able to write about someone like Tony, um, who's still very much with us, is itself a, a fascinating kind of intellectual project. So what I'd like to begin is just asking how this book, how this project came about between the two of you. Should I start? <laughs> Good afternoon. And thank you for having us here. I'm very happy to be here and very impressed about your museum and about all what is going on here. Um, yeah, we, we, we met with Professor Kruszewski 2013 as I was presenting my book about uh, the shifting of Poland after 1945 and the Polish-German border. Um, and Tony Kruszewski found me in this conference and was happy to, to meet me because it, is all, it was his topic of his PhD on University of Chicago 30 years ago, so in the 1960s. Yeah. So I did a kind of continuation of, him, of, of his work. And of course, for me, it was a honor. I knew his book published in the United States, and now I had the possibility to meet him in person. And he invited me to El Paso to the university in Texas where he was professor uh, for a lecture. And later on in 2016, uh, for one semester as a fellowship uh, to teach East Central European history at his university. And at that time, we, we started to speak about uh, his plans uh, to write an autobiography because he was already thinking about get retired and friends asked him, you should, you should write your autobiography, try to do it, we, we would like to read it. And Professor Kruszewski had just um, a challenge how to do it, how to write his own, about his own life, about to prize themselves, it's not so easy to do it. Mm, and uh, he, we just discussed wh what are the possibilities, maybe to make an interview, to make how to make such a book. And I was at that time just also looking for a topic of a, for a, for a new book project for me. So I proposed, let, let's have interviews, let, let's record this, we'll see how, how it will work. And we met in my office for, for the first interview, 
And as professor started to tell his story about Warsaw Uprising, he started with this. After two, 10 minutes, I already knew uh, I have to do it. It will be such a tremendous story. The way he's talking, the way mm, how much he remember, how, how many facts, names, dates, numbers he remember, it is really amazing. And also how he's able to put in context his life in the context of the big history. Yeah? It's also very important to, to know where I am or where I was in this moment of history. Uh, so for me, what was a, uh, obvious, this recording here, yeah, it's already very good material for me. But after recording of 40 hours interview uh, and three, 850 t uh, pages of transcription, <laughs> yeah, the work started actually, because as historian, as a professional as a researcher, I knew I have to, to check almost every fact, every, every information to check in libraries, in archives, in literature. So the work started, but uh, it was really a pleasure and it was something special. I could um, uh, ask him or give him chapter by chapter and discuss if w what he would think about it. Maybe sometimes he makes some comments or some proposed to change, but actually it was really very nice, very interesting, and I have let, learned a lot. Uh, and in such a way, 2019, the Polish edition was published, and 2021 uh, in autumn, the English edition. Yes. It's, uh, it's such a, an amazing story, and I just would all, want, like to mention to the audience that I met Beata and Tony in Warsaw, this past uh, June as part of uh, a museum tour that's uh, directed by a good friend of the museum, uh, Professor Alex Ritchie. And many of you know of her work, have seen her here before, and, and the story was, uh, myself was hearing it for the first time and meeting both of them, and I, I, it was an astounding story, and I think we're gonna be able to get into quite a bit of that with you tonight. And, and Beata, we, wa we want to come back to you and ask more about what it's like working on this kind of project here shortly. Tony, I, I want to, to begin with you, with your story. Uh, for our audience, you were born in Warsaw in yes. June of 1928. 1928. And so you were 11 years old when World War II began, when Germany invaded Poland on September 1st of 1939. So what I wanted to ask about here is for our audience, this is something that often in American history textbooks is really a footnote. It's just glossed over. Germany invades Poland and usually a sentence or two later, it's the German occupation has begun and the discussion moves forward. But this is a crucial history. So could you share with our audience about your memories, experiences of September 1939 as Germany invaded Poland, and then shortly thereafter, the Soviets invade? Well, uh, the war started for us September 1st, 1939. At six o'clock, my mother sent me to buy some bread because uh, usually I went for to bring some mi mi milk and bread. And I came back and said, Mama, the, our planes are uh, exercising, and there were German planes bombing us already. And I came home and I heard the speech by President of Poland, Ignacy Moschitski, saying, citizens of Poland, we have to fight with our eternal enemy, Germany, which just invited, in, invaded us. Uh, so for immediately from the first day, the tremendous b burning of the houses, bombing started for Warsaw. Warsaw under, was under siege for 27 days and 20% of the city was destroyed. Uh, all this special royal castle, uh, many important buildings, historical, going into centuries were destroyed in this attack. On the 27th of September, 1938, we finally capitulated because the losses of the population was too great. 50,000 people died, and, the pr and President of Warsaw, Skrzyński, decided to capitulate. Uh, in the meantime, uh, as a scout, uh, we didn't have smartphones, so 
the scouts send us on the roofs of the buildings to notify whether some fires are starting in the, ro the rooftops at the, uh, at the top of the buildings. So my mother was going from one rooftop to another because my brother was on one rooftop, I was on the other, and we were supposed to notify by telephone whether there is fire going on. Uh, initially, Germans, uh, you know, I saw even Germans uh, entering on the 27th of September, I saw first Germans coming in. And amazing enough, I saw, I saw a scene when some, one of the Poles offered him a cigarette, which meant that, that you know, they considered it's a normal war and there will be no tragedy, no terror. But it, terror started immediately. And already in, in the fall of 1939, uh, Germans executed about 20,000 people from intelligentsia, from the leaders, from the elite of the society, including Janusz Kusociński, winner of the gold medal in the Olympic Games of Los Angeles 1932, because he was an idol of the young people. And of course, they wanted to scare us and simply destroy that, I, that, uh, that, that gentleman in, in our eyes, that you, there will be repression if, if we follow his example as leadership. But mostly, they, they were execution of people who were not guilty, really, who were not politi politicians even, just cross sections of society. The immediate res res immediately after occupation of 27th of September 1939, on the very day, Polish underground army was created, Polish Home Army. The same very day, in the evening, a skeleton organization was organized, which later on grew uh, during the years of terror of occupation for fi next five years to 350,000 soldiers. And they were very young, uh, obviously, because we, we were obviously, uh, our parents were the first generation which uh, fought for Poland and uh, recovered independence of Poland in World War I. So they didn't want to lose independence of Poland. And of course, we were ta taught in school, in high school, that uh, grade school, that we obviously have to stand up and defend ourselves. So when the unholy terror started by the Germans in an incredible way, that contributed to our response, that we immediately responded in the contrary way. Instead of being scared, we were simply trying to intensify our effort to beat the Germans and to kill Germans. But the horror was obviously enormous. For every German we killed, uh, collaborate, Germans who were co collaborators or spies, Polish spies who were working for Germany, when, when they killed, for instance, a, a Jew, uh, denounced some, some people. Jews were immediately uh, beaten up. They were the first citizens of the Poland which were immediately beaten up in the first days of the uprising. Initially, they didn't touch the Catholic part of the population. They were just beating up Jews. Uh, Interesting enough, obviously, uh, then they created a ghetto and built a, a wall, which J Jewish community had to pay for the building the wall. A uh, very high wall to go going to the first floor, actually. And uh, about half a million people were brought up, Jewish citizens of Poland were brought into that ghetto. Poland had at that time three and a half million Jews half of all the population of Jew Jewish population in Europe. So they started cr bringing all the Jews from small towns and provinces and getting into, into the ghetto. If immediately they said that any help offered to the Jews and help like even giving bread to the Jews or helping, especially helping them to hide was uh, Poland was the only country occupied by Nazi Germany in Europe. It was instant death for people who were helping Jews, un unlike in other uh, countries like France, which, uh, where the situation was completely different. Uh, this, I, I'm talking about that because just months because, because uh, before World War II started, my mother was renting rooms. Uh, she was a teacher and it's, she was poorly paid, so she was renting rooms. Actually, two rooms in our house were rented. And in one was a Polish officer who later on was killed by the Soviets uh, in 1940 in the Soviet Union. And the other was a Jewish student from Gdynia, from the Polish port of Gdynia, who came to study law in Warsaw. 
Adam Tepper, and he was about six years older than I was, and about two years older than my brother Janusz, and uh, he was cooped up, and my, my mother was a heroine because she, he stayed with us for four years, from 1939 to 1943. And every ti time when he was dating, going out, and getting late, coming back home, we were mortified. We were be biting our nails, that whether Gestapo will come and kill us. Uh, is he being arrested or not? Luckily, he was not circumcised. He was, uh, of, he was uh, converted to Christianity, but in the, in the G German law, he was considered a Jew, and we were considered helping them, ob obviously helping him, actually, hiding him. So in a sense, this was a real danger. Uh, incredibly enough, during the Warsaw Uprising in 1944, when I was going through the sewers of Warsaw as a courier from the headquarters of the Home Army, crossing the German lines for help of the partisan units uh, from outside to attack Germans from behind. He was commander of the barricade and a Polish officer. During the war, when we asked him, uh, Adam, are you a member of the resistance? He said, are you crazy? I am a Jew. I have one barrier. Do you want me to have another barrier against my, my life? And he finished officer school and became com commander of barricade Mokotowska Street in Warsaw. And when I was sent as a courier by the headquarters of the Home Army to bring help from the partisan units outside Warsaw, uh, I came to the barricade and he was, uh, they said, no, you cannot go into the sewers. We were chopped up at that time already in three different parts in Warsaw. So we had to communicate through the sewers. And I will tell you in a minute, terrible experience of going through the sewers of Warsaw. But uh, uh, the, there was a young guy standing with, with his rifle at the barricade. He said, no, you cannot come. And I have shown my permission to enter the sewer, which I still have in El Paso. Uh, uh, he said, you, you cannot come because the commander of the barricade has to come and he's talking to the commander of the, ba of the battalion. And he came in half an hour and it was Adash Tepper, my Jewish friend from, <laughs> from who lived with us for four years. We kissed and greeted each other. I went into the sewers and he died three days later at the same barricade because they were wiped out. The German tanks attacked the barricade and, and about three officers and three uh, non-commissioned officers died at the barricade. Uh, I put his name now on the, on the wall of uh, uh, people who died in the Warsaw Uprising. There is a wall, memory wall, 18,000 soldiers of the Warsaw Uprising. So after years living in El Paso, I communicated with the Museum of uh, Warsaw Uprising in Poland and put his name there because, and I wrote an essay about his life that he died a Jewish guy fighting as a Polish officer and living with us for four years. Tony, it's, it's such a, that's such an incredible story in the book. I. I had a hard time not just getting emotional, mm -hmm. just reading the story about Adam Tepper. And we're going to get into some real detail about your experiences in the uprising here in, in just a moment. I, I wanted to ask a question, though, of Beata that came up today in conversations that we had. And I think it's, especially for our audience, it's really worth hearing this perspective. Beata, you mentioned that speaking of footnotes in typical American history textbooks, that it's always mentioned that on September 3rd, 1939, Britain and France declare war on Hitler, on Nazi Germany, two days after the German invasion. In Poland, that is remembered in a very particular way. Could you say something about how that is remembered, that date of September 3rd? Yes, I, uh, I was reading many ego documents or memories about the, the first day of September. And at that moment, uh, of course, Poles were shocked about the war, but they knew we have an agreement with uh, France and with Great Britain. They will support us. Yeah, They will also not only declare the war, but also join the war and, and support us. So as uh, September 3rd, uh, both countries mm, uh, declared the war. There was a big um, uh, 
uh, commitment or the big uh, uh, in front of French uh, uh, ambassador, people come together and really celebrated it. They have joined the war, so we will fight together. And really the expectation was they will help us. And then one week, two weeks goes and nothing happens. So it was a huge disappointment among Polish citizens that we didn't receive this support, this help from France and Great Britain. And they only declared the war, but not really entered the war with military action. And so we, we remained alone uh, and had to, to, to fight with Germans alone, of course, for a short time. It what became known as the, the phony war. And I would just add one thing um, to Tony's comments about September 1939 and October 1939, this terror unleashed against the Polish intelligentsia that one of the key figures responsible for that is someone I think most of this audience would know was Reinhard Heydrich is entrusted with this mission by Hitler and Heinrich Himmler, the head of the SS. And he has these SS and police teams who come into Poland with lists of intellectuals, journalists, politicians, Catholic clergy, et cetera, and they are rounded up and either executed or often sent to concentration camps. And that's often forgotten. Tony, getting to your story, kind of pushing it forward. In 1943, you get very involved in resistance activity that, that year, right? You mentioned the scouting organization and I'm sure you'll tell us about that, its connections to the Polish home army you've already introduced. So you're 15 when you get involved in resistance activity, 1943. That's the year of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising that's crushed. And then the following year, so we're now some six to eight weeks after D-Day, and after the big Soviet offensive, Bagration, June 22nd, 23rd of 1944, the Polish Home Army has decided it's time. It's time as the Red Army is getting closer to carry out an uprising. It's in a remarkable story told in Beata's book about the scouting organization and what it's doing in the days leading up to the uprising on August 1st. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, the scouting Polish scouting organization was in, uh, immediately after Nazi occupation, uh, living under the code name Grey Ranks, changed the name from Polish scouting to Grey Ranks, and divided into three groups of people. Uh, kids from 12 to 14 were supposed to be trained to be liaison and uh, making small sabotage, like changing signs. Germans had German signs all over the city of Warsaw, and we were turning them around so the tanks or trucks would go a different way. Or painting that symbol, uh, Fighting Poland, PW, which starts for Fighting Poland, Polska Walcząca, which is a symbol of Polish Home Army. And uh, we are painting this on the walls of this, of this uh, street, that we are in control, still Germans are in control of the city, but we are still in control of the city. And for painting those signs all over the ta ta city, we used small boys uh, because they, they could disappear immediately and hide in the cellars or whatever. And of course, you could die if they were arrested, they, they went sent to concentration camp. So this was little, called little sabotage, but initially those, uh, those uh, teams of so-called Zavisha, the youngest groups, were not supposed to be used in fighting because they wanted to preserve young kids, obviously, for the future of Poland. After Poland is uh, won the war and, and rebuilt uh, Polish scouting movement. Uh, I was uh, uh, in the high school, and we, all the schools in, in Warsaw were uh, this, this closed down. Only Fifth, fifth grade was enough for Poland. Poland was supposed to count to 100 and say, yes, jawohl, yes, in German. But otherwise, they abolished all the schools, including high schools and universities. So we rebuilt completely a secret state, which provided not only scouting, but also judicial system, high school, two universities in Warsaw, complete the system of also retribution, so for every traitor, for every German who was a criminal, we were killing them. But Germans responded. For every German we killed, they killed 100 people, 
drift, taking them from streetcars and trams and executing them in front. My, my future wife was led by the hand by her mother, an American born in Chicago who lived in Poland at that time. And said, she said, mama, mama, we walked with some kind of paint and it was blood execution just 10 minutes before or 20 minutes before there was an execution. So this was the unholy uh, terror. Uh, actually, we had a story that every year of the terror of the Nazi, five and a half years I lived under, uh, counted double. So in reality, I wasn't 16 as a commander of the scouting movement, but I was 21 years perhaps as a similar to the uh, lut American lieutenant who was leading a platoon. Uh, and when I joined the scouting movement, I was 15 actually, 1943, but within one year, they promoted me to a command 100 boys who were spying on the Germans. And uh, actually, uh, they, they said that they discovered some documents, Beata actually discovered some documents that discovered that they found that I have leading qualities, I can command and lead qualities, so they promoted me to have 100 boys. And just before, Warsaw Uprising, where we had, I had 100 boys uh, spying on the Germans, standing on all the streetcar corners and uh, bus stops and uh, tram stops, pretending that they are waiting for the next streetcar or bus. But in reality, they're watching Germans, how many more Germans were coming in the city, what units, and they were uh, very well trained in uh, distinguished doc Doc, German units and divisions and all that, so we're supposed to remember that and then write reports, which I was in the evening carried to the headquarters of the Polish Home Army. For that, obviously, we would be caught. They couldn't write anything at the bus stop or streetcar corner, but they had to remember and then reported that. But if, if they would be caught, they would be killed on the spot, obviously, or sent to concentration camp. And just uh, just before Warsaw Uprising started at five o'clock on the 1st of August, 1944, uh, the, the, uh, one of the guys who was standing in the Washington roundabout, which is uh, on the east side of, of Warsaw, leading throwaway east-west, and we're watching the throwaway because they were escaping from, from Eastern Front to Germany, uh, that he c cannot come at four o'clock to watch the Germans. So I ran there, the buses were not, so I ran actually, instead of walking because the, I had to be there at four o'clock and I changed him and I stood in front of him. And at five, 15 to five, Hermann Goering division came into the park uh, and we, I couldn't report this already because it was obviously too late, 15 minutes to the uprising. And I of course didn't know that the uprising will start in 15 minutes. So I started running through Poniatowski bridge across the Vistula uh, and that was uh, what my friend, an American general, said this was decision at the bridge. If you, if you get east, I would probably end up walking on Berlin with the communist-led army, Polish army, the, to Berlin. If I went east, uh, west, obviously I would join the uprising and never come to America. So I decided to go, not because of political reasons like that, but simply there were big houses in central Warsaw on the west side, so I knew that I won't be killed. And the east side of Warsaw, there were small houses and little houses and, and gardens. And I, I was afraid that if I ran there, they would kill me machine gun. There was unholy machine gun fire going on the bridge and because our troops at that time were attacking the bridge, tried to capture the bridges. Obviously they couldn't capture the bridges because they had machine guns there and artillery and, and we had only pistols. So I turned west, ran down, uh, to join the Polish units starting the uprising and there was a triangle and the German bunker was shooting both ways and in this way, this manner. So I couldn't cross the street for about three hours until it came a little da dark. And, uh, and I crossed the street and joined the Kribar battalion uh, along the Vistula, which was supposed to c capture the bridges. Uh, well, I crossed the street and I expected to get weapons. The only weapons I got was two Molotov cocktail bottles. And those were the only weapons I had in the Warsaw Uprising. And with those bottles, we destroyed two tanks in the third day of the uprising because Germans were stupid enough to send tanks against us. And they didn't realize that we were standing in the ruins of the 
higher schools of uh, of uh, uh, beautiful art of uh, fine arts, the fine yeah. academy of fine arts of the arts uh, school of arts and the ruins and in this in this in the cellars and small guys could come to the tank and throw the bottle and destroy the tank. So we destroyed uh, two tanks in the third day. I didn't sleep three days at all. Energy was driven us. I lost the commander who was killed the first day and I had to dig his grave in the first day, I remember. We, had, we were lifting sidewalks and burying people under sidewalks. Uh, then, then I uh, decided that uh, since there were reports of the scouting units, all the groups of scouts were fighting in the home army in the Vola district in, Pol in Warsaw. And, uh, and I, there were reports and immediately we started newspapers publishing reports about various units fighting in Warsaw on the in the first week of the uprising. And the Polish scouting units was the, the bravest and the best equipped actually defending the he headquarters of the home army in the uprising. So I wanted to be transferred there to join them. And I appealed to, to the commander of, the, of my battalion, and they said, like, yes, you, we can transfer you to the scouting unit. And I got to the headquarters of the scouting unit halfway through the, uh, on the way to, to join the battalion, but unfortunately they were already withdrawing in different direction to the old town of Warsaw. Is, is called Starówka, the old town, the oldest town of Warsaw, and I wouldn't get there, I wouldn't be able to go, go there because they were already cap, cut in three pieces in Warsaw because Germans recaptured the highways across Warsaw trying to clear the road for their own escape from east, from west to east. And uh, I went to, simply stopped in the uh, scouting headquarters and they said, no, we need commanders like you to organize the post office. Because, you know, most of the parents in Warsaw, their children disappeared and they didn't know what, what was happening. 17% of the home army was composed of women, which women w were braver sometimes than men, and, and people under the age of 20. And they, they wanted to know about their children. So the scouting unit organized post office and we carried 150,000 letters through to build up morale of the citizens of Warsaw, to notify them what was happening in different parts of Warsaw. Uh, so I was made deputy commander of one of the post offices in, in central Warsaw. But then, then I was afraid that this is not enough for me. I want to do something more constructive. So actually, only a 16-year-old guy like myself could say something like that. I went to the headquarters of the Home Army and said, give, give me the most dangerous and, and more constructive job so I can contribute better to the uprising. And they said, yes, we can do it. And they said, you will go 50 miles outside Warsaw to, through the German lines and deliver a message for General Borko Morowski, which message which was in, included in my jacket, inside the jacket and uh, you have to deliver that for the partisan units to attack Germans from behind. Uh, well, Warsaw was divided in three parts, so I had to go through sewers, and this was the most horrible experience of my life. Water was up to here, and you know what sewers are. And, and uh, you know, in the sewers, a, a girl which was leading me actually saved my life, because at one point I wanted to simply give up and die there. There were dead bodies, hand grenades, and were thrown in by the Germans, gas, uh, dead bodies, it was terrible. And water was up to here. Uh, and I, incredibly enough, I had lumps of sugar, which is the only food I had, and I was eating this with this dirt, you know, dirty water, and that was the only food I had at the time. So I had some, some at, least, at least some food. Uh, I w went about five miles uh, um, through the sewers, Three times I emerged from the sewers in the Polish sections of commander, and I was arrested by the Germans in Vilanów, part of Warsaw, the royal palace of King John, King John II in, from the Battle of Vienna in 1683. And I pretended to tell, look, I'm lo looking for my mama. I lost my mama. I said, no, you are not looking for your mama. You are a liaison from the carrier from the, because I smelled. I didn't realize I smelled from the sewers. <laughs> Uh, so he, they arrested me, and incredibly enough, during secret uh, high school I was uh, attending for two years before, 
a, a, poly, a, a woman who was teaching us German, a German woman who was teaching us, collaborating with, with us as a Polish citizen. She was teaching us German, so I was fluent in German. So I started talking to the German, old man German who was uh, guarding us. And he was about 70 years old, and he, and he saved my life. He said, uh, they are going to kill you in three maximum three days. You have to escape. I cannot help you, because if I help you, they will kill me. So I managed incredibly enough later on to escape. Uh, they were, were digging trenches because they were afraid that the Russians would go cross the Vistula River and, and so they were dig, digging trenches against to, to worry, they were worried about uh, attack by the future G Russian army across the Vistula. Of course, they didn't come, come then, they came much later, four months later. And I escaped from that and went 50 kilometers, about 30 miles to Milanovek outside, delivered the message. They said, we cannot attack Warsaw from behind because we don't have machine guns and all the supplies were, there were not enough supplies and weapons. And they said, stay with, with us. Well, I couldn't stay there because if I stayed there, I saw burning Warsaw. I saw all my colleagues in, in Warsaw fighting. So I went back to Warsaw through the same sewers and I made the decision, I was going to the woods and there were two ducks through the woods and a, any mini money more, the left one or right one. If I went the right one, I would end up probably in the same place <laughs> they arrested me. Luckily, I went to the left, crossed it and came to the palace which on the, was on the hill, and they said, stop, this is a Polish uh, line, what's your signal for the day? And I didn't know the signal, so you are a German spy. And I said, no, I'm not a German spy, I'm a returning courier for the headquarters of the Polish Home Army. And I went to commander-in-chief of the, they sent me back, and I went again through the sewers to the central location of Warsaw, and delivered my report. Tony, this is an amazing story, I think we would just sit here I think all of us with uh, with goosebumps and, and listen to this, the stories are incredible and we yeah, wish we just had more time. So what I thought I would do in my final question, I'm gonna turn over to my friend and colleague, Jeremy Collins, who will fill questions from the audience. I thought would ask, this is really for both of you, you could answer this one just briefly and then everyone else I'm sure will have questions about, Tony, what happened to you later in the war and of yeah. course your long life Sure. Starting in the early 1950s here in the U.S., there's so much to say. How did you end up in a city like El Paso? Yeah, exactly. Right? How, you know, so there's, there's a lot to say. But this is really for both you and Beata. If you could just answer something, I think, kind of succinct for our audience who may not know a lot about the Warsaw Rising. But here at the museum, we talk a lot about what does World War II mean today? Why is it important to study World War II, to know about it? And so... In this case, the Warsaw Rising of 44, what do you think really is important? Why is it important today? Why does it matter today? Why should we know about this crucial history today? Tony, we'll start with you and then Beata, and then we're gonna turn it over to Jeremy. It is crucial for Poles, for us all. So the, the, all what happened during World War II on the territory of Poland, yeah, it, it was really crucial I even until today. So many Poles really remembered uh, and know a lot about the history because it, it really changed everything in case of Poland because Poland have been shifted to the west, uh, to, to the west after the end of the war. Uh, and we had a completely uh, exchange of population in the West. So it, it was really a tremendous change at the end of the war. But uh, I could speak long about it, but uh, maybe what, what uh, also uprising means and why it was so important. Um, it is uh, important to know that as, as it started, Russian Red Army was very close already to, uh, to Warsaw and to Vistula River. So we expected it will be two or three days, like in Paris, as, Ameri as American soldiers yeah, uh, arrived. Yeah? It took three days and Americans came to Paris. So this uprising of Paris was very, very short, yes? And they could welcome American soldiers yeah, as, as, uh, as liberators. And we wanted to do, in a similar way, just to welcome Russians, yeah, Soviets, uh, in our ca uh, capital. Hmm? But what Russians did was really, 
unimaginable because they stopped on on the on the river uh, uh, Vistula, yeah? and they didn't move. Uh, Stalin decided let Poles fight with with the Germans. We will see what happened. Yeah? And uh, Soviets remained for three months waiting what happened. And at this time, this terrible uprising, uh, so many people died. And after the end of the uprising, uh, Soviets remained still there. And Germans started to destroy Warsaw three months until January. So it is a half a year where they didn't move, even if we were allies of uh, allies of of uh, of World War Two. Yeah. Um, so we really felt uh, um, really felt uh, that that we we remain alone. Yes. Yeah? So and first with January forty five. Uh, Soviet army entered Warsaw, and it was for us not a liberation, uh, it was a, a new occupation. So it is very complicated. It's not only fighting against Nazi Germany, it's also fighting ag against Soviet Union with deportation to Siberia, with, uh, with uh, the massacre of Katyn, of Polish officers. Yeah, there are so many facts which are so so dramatic and so important for us. And of course, uh, it is one small part of World War II history. Uh, your, your exhibition, your museum shows how, how, how were many difficult uh, f battlefields of the World War II took place. But also Polish history and what happened at East Central Europe is also a very important part of it. And uh, for us, because of this, we are here today just to tell you also the, our perspective on the story or our part of, of the history of World War II. I would like to add something. You know, uh, this uprising was designed at the beginning of World War II. As I said, on the day, very day, Warsaw capitulated 27 September 1939. From the very beginning, we organized Home Army, the largest resistance movement in, in, in Europe. And we wanted to restore dem democracy in independent Poland. We were commanded by the Polish general staff in London and the Polish government in exile. And all the orders were sent from London by radio. The, when they were in the BBC programs, actually in Polish language. So we are trying for vengeance, and this is, we expected that to welcome Russians as the allies of our allies, as we call them, allies of our allies, that we will welcome them to Warsaw and liberate Warsaw alone. And when they were across the Vistula, they didn't move at all. They stopped the very minute we started because they wanted Germans to destroy us, so they, it, it did not actually prevent their attempt to create communist Poland, which they created and ran for 40 years until uh, 1989. So uh, Warsaw Uprising was, was supposed to uh, last only one week or two, 10 days and lasted 63 days. And the tragedy was, of course, we half of the members of the resistance movement died. There were 30,000 of us, but we were volunteers, so we knew that we would die. Actually, I told the girl f who was fi fighting with me, uh, uh, she said, Jupiter, my code name was Jupiter. Jupiter, are we going to die? I said, of course, we will die with honor because we are volunteers. But there were 150,000 civilians killed by the, by the Nazis. They burned alive my grandmother senior citizens' home, they boarded out the house and burned them alive. My mother ended up in concentration camp. She was not Jewish, she was Polish intellectual teacher. Uh, I lost uh, another grandmother also. Uh, she died in the Warsaw Uprising. So, you know, those were the horrors of, of the occupation. So we were full of vengeance. We wanted to fight. We wanted to restore independent Poland, but Soviet Union didn't help us instead. Why? Because they wanted to establish communist Poland. Not only communist Poland, but the, all those 12 countries from Estonia all the way to Macedonia and, and Yugoslavia, which they did. And they kept this for, for 50 years. So the end of World War II for those countries in Poland was really end of World War II was 1989 with solidarity in Wałęsa. But let me add another comment as a political scientist. Only because we bled and we didn't win and we left this residue of the fight for independence and freedom, uh, solidarity was able 
to have bloodless revolution and the uh, solidarity movement, which was workers' union, f stopped working and forced the communists. The communists could control Poland, but they couldn't force people to work. So the result was there was no uprising in 1990s. Otherwise, there would be a bloody uprising in 1990s. Because after 50 years of communism, in which Beata grew up, they were also full of vengeance against Russians who grabbed half of the Polish territory. 46% of Poland was annexed by Soviet Union, and they killed 20,000 Polish officers in 1940. Uh, those were reserve officers. They were elite. They were not regular, most regular. They were attorneys, priests. There were a variety of people who were served in the army. Uh, so. There was this, this kind of element also. So that's why the communists wanted simply, they allowed Germans to destroy us. But in a way, in a sense, I feel that in a way, our sacrifice prevented Poland from ever going into another uprising. All my colleagues at the University of Texas thought there will be another uprising. You will be bloody again and you will lose again. And we, this time we didn't. Solidarity won. And after Ber the Berlin Wall has fallen, and Poland regained independence in 1989. Tony, Beata, thank you very much. What a wonderful uh, conversation. I'm now going to turn it over to Jeremy, who will handle the remainder of the Q&A. Please raise your hand, and I'll bring the microphone to you. Did the Allies provide any assistance to the Polish Home Army uh, prior to the uprising? He's asking, did the, the Allies, the Western Allies, provide any assistance to the Polish Home Army yes. prior to the uprising? Yes, they did. And there were brave pilots, American pilots, Polish pilots, South African pilots, and British pilots, all volunteers. And they are honored, obviously, they died they were all volunteered and they dropped supplies. But Warsaw is beyond the range. Those are f the years where the planes they couldn't fly that far. They could fly up to western border of Poland, but they couldn't reach Warsaw. What we didn't know, that Soviets would refuse landing privileges for uh, western pilots to refuel in, at the airports outside Warsaw, which could, they could have easily refused. But we didn't know that in the Tehran conference, which Churchill and Roosevelt met with uh, Stalin, at that time, decision was made by the Western allies to assign Poland to the Soviet sphere of interest. And all the military decisions were made by the Soviet Union. We didn't know about it. Anybody who died after 1943, to some extent, died in vain. Because the because, uh, Soviet Union refused to uh, even American troops to land, not to say about help for the uprising. Uh, the biggest supply of, uh, finally, after relentless attempts to, the, to discover, to the get permission from the Soviets, uh, the Soviets allowed on the 18th of September, uh, more than 100 American planes flew over Warsaw. And we were thinking this was the Polish parachute brigade, which was trained for very purpose and were and fought in Market Garden in Holland, and that they are jumping to help us. But there were supplies dropped by the Americans at that time. Five of the American planes were shut down at that time. I attended a celebration three weeks ago in Warsaw, organized by American embassy and Polish Museum of Warsaw Uprising to honor them because they, 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 they named schools for the, those p pilots in Warsaw three weeks ago and, and there was a tremendous ceremony and the highest commanding officers of the American army was present there. Uh, chief of the co combined chief of staffs was the, the, the dedication. So, uh, you know, the Soviets allowed Americans to come but at that time we were, this was after 50 uh, days of fighting and we were holding on the smaller sections of Warsaw, and most of the supplies really went to the Germans. They got about 60% of the supplies, unfortunately, the Germans. And then, uh, then they were smoking American cigarettes <laughs> and, and, and also su eating Euro sub American supplies. And of course, that didn't help us, and we had to capitulate after 63 days. In, in oct October 5th, I was taken prisoner, and I stayed as a POW for one year sent to Zandbostel camp halfway between Berlin and, and Hamburg. 
Uh, Tony, we have a question online. Somebody wants to know if, like in America, reunion groups, veterans associations, was there any gathering of your group after the war? Anybody from the Polish Home Army, or did you need to stay quiet for the Soviet, uh, for fear of Soviet repercussions? Well, you know, I decided to stay abroad after uh, I was liberated by the Canadians from the POW camp. I couldn't go back home because they started arresting Polish uh, Home Army soldiers. And would you believe a communist government of Poland demanded to, f f when I was in a, later on, I rejoined the Polish army uh, under mm, British command, but I was stationed for a while in France. And fr when France recognized the uh, communist government of Poland in, ju in June 1945, the Polish consulate, communist consulate established in, Le in Marseille demanded that they hand over us as criminals for burning Warsaw. At that time, Polish intelligence smuggled out from southern France to the second Polish Corps, 100,000 of soldiers under the command of General Anders in, in the 8th British Army. And at the, bo can at the border between Italy and, and uh, France, there were British soldiers and Polish soldiers. There were no Frenchmen or Italians at the border. And they smuggled us out. For in five days, they came. Uh, we were in tents, and they, uh, jeeps came and loaded us on 10 people every day for five days, and they evacuated 50 of us to the, uh, to the army, which was uh, stationed in Italy because we, we, they were afraid that, of course, we would be handed over to the Soviets. In Poland, why I didn't go back? Because they started arresting. One of my colleagues in the Home Army later on joined the Communist, Ar uh, Communist Party and was actually working as correspondent. And he was arrested later on because the, during the Stalinist period, they were arresting many people. And the, one of the greatest heroes of Polish, uh, uh, Colonel Pilecki, who was smugg smuggled himself to Auschwitz and, and presented a report on the P Auschwitz concentration camp and escaped from that and reported to the Polish <coughs> government, British government, and American government. He was, when he p came back to Poland, he was arrested and killed in 1949. He was one of the biggest heroes of Polish underground. And, and of course, now they named the streets after him, but, but you know, this was the, that's why quarter of a million Polish soldiers remained in abroad, and that's why they were scattered all over the world. I have friends scattered all over Africa, Asia, <laughs> and Australia. Uh, they didn't come back home to Poland until Poland regained independence, and for Poland, World War II start, ended 1989, when Lech Wałęsa and Solidarity won, peaceful revolution. Thank you. Uh, well, maybe I Bianca? can add to the question, Justice, uh, the Polish veterans, they created a group of veterans abroad in the United States, in Great Britain. They were organized and they kept, kept together. Yeah, but in, in communistic Poland, it was the first years not allowed, of course. Then we started a discussion yeah, how to deal with all these soldiers who were fighting in Warsaw Uprising. You know? um, and after 1956, after this uh, political toll, uh, it, it was more or less acceptable just to say they were also soldiers, yeah, and uh, there were a kind of possibility to organize themselves as, as a group of veterans, but they were not heroes yes, of Poland. It was just, it was as difficult, yeah. Thank you. And let me add one thing. Polish Home Army in Eastern Territories, which were annexed by Soviet Union, they were sent to Siberia second time around. First, they were uh, arrested in, in 1941, sent to Siberia, and many of them escaped, left Siberia because there was a deal between Polish government and British government, and those refugees, they were allowed to go uh, out, leave Soviet Union through Persia and India and Pakistan, and then fought in Italy under General Anders. But, uh, you know, uh, some of them after World War II, after fighting, uh, capturing Monte Cassino and fighting in World War II in the Second Polish Corps, 100,000 of them in Italy, some, some of them couldn't go back to Poland because that part of Poland where they left was annexed by Soviet Union. And since they had wife and wives and children, they went back. And the second time around, they were sent to Siberia. 
I met a person on the train from Siberia to Moscow when I was uh, later on in Soviet Union in 1990 when I became vice president of Polish National Co Polish American Congress, and and the lady said I'm teaching Polish in Irkutsk, and I said how did you find out in Irkutsk? My father came back and was arrested again in 1952 and sent back to Siberia second time around. First in 1941 and then in 52, and I was born in Irkutsk. I went to the University of Irkutsk, studied Polish, <laughs> and I'm teaching Polish to the Polonia, Polish community in, in Siberia. <laughs> I met her on the train. <laughs> so my question is for actually both of you, and thank you again for your, for your talk. Tony, you had mentioned a little bit ago in your description of the uprising that women were braver than men. So I didn't know if, if both or either of you could talk a little bit more about what the role of women was in the uprising. Well, the percentage of women was much larger uh, because obviously it was a cross-section of the nation. You know, from when the terror started, this horrible terror started actually in 1939, 1940. So uh, my mother never asked me whether I was in the in the resistance, but she would, if I would say that I am not, probably she would be disappointed. So there were many women who, uh, who actually, because they, they, this was the first generation of independent Poland in 1920, 1918, 1920. My father was fighting against the Bolsheviks in 1920, victory of Poland over Bolsheviks in 1920, over victory over Lenin and, and uh, Stalin at that time and they pushed back Miracle on the Vistula. So that was a generation, and obviously they expected their children, my, us, to do the same thing, fight again for Poland, for independence, for democracy. And that's why women, this was, there was a large percentage, much larger than in any allied army. And especially in, you know, they were incredibly brave, uh, saving in, you know, the person, medical personnel, composed complete, almost completely of women, you know, they were dying in our eyes, they were running and helping us and bringing back people who were dying in front, of us, in front of our lines, and they knew they would be killed. And later on, they were horribly, uh, they were, you know, treated by the, by the Soviet, by the uh, Germans, violated, and you know, it was horrible, absolutely horrible. They killed practically several hospitals in Warsaw, they ex executed not only all the women, personnel, medical personnel, priests who were there, and all the patients. They were not taking prisoners. On the other hand, the guy, I, I am talking to you right now because I was saved by a German, so that, that German was a, a human being. The others were beasts, obviously, and you know, this was the situation. When we are talking about the involvement of women in World War II, it is not only as soldiers, even if there were women as soldiers, yeah? and not only nurses. Yeah? Because if we are talking about this underground state and the whole organization, so they were involved in many different uh, ways, as couriers, as a teacher in underground, yes, as a journalist writing uh, latest, so th they were really uh, very much involved in all what doesn't mean the way to fight with Germans. Uh, but after the end of uh, the Warsaw Uprising, they were recognized as soldiers, and as they were sent to prison, to, to uh, German captivity, uh, uh, it was an agreement between Germans and Pol Poles in the moment of the end of uprising, that all this person will be recognized as soldiers and also women. Yeah, for the, for the first time after the end of the Warsaw Uprising, Germans had about 1,900 women who, who were prisoners of war, and they had to create a separate uh, uh, captivity for them because it was something new for them to have, to have prisoners of women. Yeah? Uh, so it is really a very, very important chapter of, of the history. Yeah. If I could just add something, um, especially after reading looking at Beata's book and talking with Beata and Tony, that it's, it's worth remembering that the, the uprising happens on August 1st, 1944, less than two weeks before that, was the assassination attempt on Hitler. And Hitler, of course, by that point was very distrustful of his army leadership because of the connections to the plot. So when the uprising breaks out, who does he turn to to crush the rising? It's the SS. So the scale of brutality that 
Beata and Tony talk about, 150 to 200,000 civilians slaughtered, 15 to 20,000 members of the home army killed, the savagery of that, um, not to let the German army off the hook, but the SS is actually the organization entrusted with putting down the rising. And they're never condemned for that, for Warsaw Uprising at Nuremberg, because communists were blocking that, obviously, uh, the trial of Germans. So th thanks to Tony, to Beata and Jason uh, for these incredible insights. So let's give them a, a round of applause here. And, and Tony, you deserve a special shout out. Thanks for your service and sacrifice in the war that, that changed the world. You know, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, we, we do have a few copies of uh, the biography for sale in the, in the lobby that Tony and Beato uh, can sign. We also have some flyers if you'd like to get those signed as well. Uh, it's a pretty cool opportunity. I'd also uh, you know, want to uh, ask you to mark your calendars for some upcoming programs we have. On, on October 18th, uh, Bob Sutton will be here. He's the former chief historian of the National Park Service. Talk about his book, Nazis on the Potomac. Um, and uh, on October 26th, uh, best-selling author James Scott on his new book, Black Snow, about the B-29 raids over Japan. And of course, uh, hope to see uh, many of you, whether in person or online, in November for our international conference. So uh, thanks again to our, our folks on stage. Thanks to our folks in the audience. And thanks for the folks online. Uh, thank you much, and, and good night. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Excellent question. Excellent question.